Never before in American history has so much of our culture taken place through a screen. In the digital era, and especially during a pandemic, our relationships, media, entertainment, and education are all delivered to us through our phones and computers. So if we're serious about winning America's culture war in the conservative movement, we have to go where the culture is, on social media. In this episode of On the Front Lines, we're covering the digital fight for America's future on campus at the University of North Alabama, Wesleyan College, the University of Washington, Juilliard, and even the Supreme Court of the United States. We'll sit down with one of our outstanding Turning Point ambassadors who's making a difference online and meet a California professor spreading leftist propaganda all over the internet. All this and more, I'm Isabel Brown, and this is On the Front Lines. But there's a lot of liberal indoctrination. Universities don't stand for objective truth. Insulting us, threatening us. We are on the front lines. Hey guys, my name is Kong Min Lee. It's like Kingman, but you switch the vowels. And I am a Turning Point USA ambassador, a social media influencer, speaker, and commentator. Recently, I was fired from my job because of the conservative beliefs I shared on social media, namely being against the vaccine mandates and being very pro-Second Amendment and believing that we should have the right to keep and bear arms. And it is never easy being a conservative in today's day and age, but I believe that we need to fight and double down because our beliefs are actually more popular than you would believe. So, my name is Kong Min Lee and I am on the front lines. Please welcome to the show one of our rock star TPUSA ambassadors, Kongmin Lee. Kongmin, I'm so excited to have you on the show. You do some incredible work with our TPUSA ambassador team. We do a lot of work together with Students for Life, but I know your journey to really find your voice and build a following on social media started for you in college. Walk us through what that looked like a little bit. Yeah, so actually it was my last semester of college uh, when I became conservative. So throughout college, I was pretty liberal. And then it was my last semester of college when I realized the media lies and the slandering and the smears around conservatives and Trump, President Trump. And then I realized, wow, I dug into it and I became conservative. And I was actually pretty quiet. So I was pretty quiet because I knew all my friends were liberal and they're very outspoken liberal posting about BLM and social justice, transgenderism, all that stuff. So I started a separate Instagram account and I just started to post and it was private because I was working for a corporate company. And then um, I realized in October, November, I was like, okay, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all the way because I know there's a lot of Asians out there too yeah. who are conservative, but they're just so scared because there aren't Asian conservative voices. So I started to speak out and I started to make content and then people started to find it and then now I'm here. As you have built a following and generated such an incredible audience, you're approaching 100,000 followers on Instagram. Just you passed have, it. You just passed yeah, it today. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that is great <laughs> news. Congratulations. And about 50,000 followers on TikTok. What type of content were you feeling inspired to share with people? So the kind of content that I put out, whether it's you know comedic skits or whether it's factual infographics or just you know, pictures of me with a long caption. <laughs> um, everything is just to, you know, galvanize and invigorate people to fight. Because right now, like, we are in the fourth turning and we are the generation today that will determine whether or not we have a country. As our world has transitioned so severely to an online platform in the time of COVID-19, online content has never been more important than it is right now. And you talk a lot about these traditional values online, Christianity, having a faith in something bigger than our society, really rooting yourself in marriage and a family. Why do you feel so inspired to share that type of content and what drives you in those areas? Because it's, it's the key to prosperity. And so, you know, life is suffering and Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this, but that's just a guarantee in life. But then what gives you meaning? What gives you purpose? And it's a lot of these traditional values. And what we see today is a war on these trad traditional values because mm -hmm. nefarious actors in Hollywood and big tech and our government and academia, entertainment, everywhere. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to be happy. They don't want you to be fulfilled. And they want to be the reason why you live, right? Yeah. After graduation, you have stayed very vocal and even gotten more vocal about your most interpersonal values and beliefs, especially on social media. How has that impacted your real world life, particularly in the job market? Has it been difficult to find a job, to keep a job? I know there's a story from this week that you and I talked about before the interview. Would you mind sharing some of that with us? Yeah, so I just got fired. <laughs> 
Still heartbroken, um, by the way. I just got fired, so I worked for a pharma company, and so I was pretty quiet about it. And obviously, there's a social media policy with that company, so if I shared anything about the company, and then the only thing I shared about the company is that they imposed a vaccine mandate, and I'm going to oppose it. I started to speak out against the vaccine mandates, and I started to speak out at the company as well, and then they, they saw me as a threat. Like, that's just a what it is. A violent threat, if I remember from your Instagram live. Why did they say you, of all people who, by the way, is the least violent person that I know, posed a violent threat to the company? They said that I posed a reasonable violent threat to the company because I said on my social media, I will fight like hell for, against the vaccine mandates. But I clearly said in the caption underneath that, start conversations, yeah. talk to people, get the information out there, don't be silenced. No call to violence whatsoever. And then they said, oh, there's this one comment on my other post that was not on that post. And I said, hey, now's a good time to buy a gun. And then they're like, they equated <laughs> so two that. two completely different issues. Yeah, and then they're like, oh, based on these posts, we have come to the conclusion that you pose a, viol a reasonable violent threat. And this is an egregious policy infraction. And you go against our company policy and we fired you. What completely baffles me about your story from this week and really over the last few years working in science, we're both from a science background, which is awesome. You were just advocating for something that scientists forever have been passionate about, and that is medical freedom, the ability to decipher what is objective truth and make those decisions for oneself. I have yet to ever meet a scientist until this last year or so that was opposed to medical freedom. And now all of a sudden, asking the right questions, going after the data and really analyzing that on a deeper level is frowned upon and even find uh, an opportunity for you to get completely fired for your job. Knowing all of that and knowing that science has so dramatically changed over the last few years, would you still go back and make the same posts about medical freedom on your social media knowing it ended in you losing your job? Oh, 100%. I mean, absolutely. Questioning science is science. That's the whole point of science. You have a hypothesis and you test it, you question it, and then if your hypothesis was wrong, then you change it. But then they establish the science and then we say, hey, no, you're wrong. And then once they can't hold on to that narrative any longer, they keep shifting the goalpost. And I'm not here for it. And I will always, always, always stand up for medical freedom because I care about my fellow Americans. And ultimately, again, I don't want to raise a family yeah. where they have to get the 30th COVID booster shot in order to get a burger from Shake Shack. You have been so inspiring in the last few months, courageously posting everything that you believe in and encouraging people to wake up online. And that digital medium is so important now more than ever before because we have an opportunity as individuals and even independent journalists, so to speak, to reach so many people all at once outside of the people controlling the narrative. What messaging do you have or advice do you have for viewers of the show if they are interested in starting to grow a following on social media? Where do they start? What can they run after? How can they use social media as a tool to tell the truth? I think Charlie said this in either back in July or in December, but he said that we're all influencers. We're all influencers to a certain extent. I know it, that that word kind of became like this cool thing, like, oh, like this social media influencer with all these followers. But the most impact that you can have and the most contributions, I guess the biggest contribution, the most meaningful, significant contributions you can have to this world is to change your local communities in your home. Be a loving father, mother, brother, sister, you know, whatever you are in your family, right? Um, take care of your family members, make sure they know the truth. And then also in your local communities, in your church, in your school, at anywhere you are, make sure you're changing hearts and minds, you know, get grab a coffee with a friend, love them, show them that you're listening to them eat when they're misinformed, show them the truth about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And then also twofold, um, we've got to be loud on social media because like you said, we live in a digital age. We have to be loud and we have to be vocal because we want to change the culture and we want to put pressure on our elective representatives. We want to put pressure on these huge corporations and let them know, hey, we will not buy our products. Hey, we will not engage in this because, you know, they always follow the money. So they're going to do what the money, you know, where the money goes. And then so they will listen to us. So we have to be loud on social media, not only to, um, you know, change the, like the direction of this country from like a top-down perspective with all these bureaucrats, but also to change hearts and minds. And so, again, the approach is twofold. Be a light in your community, but also be a light on social media. You are about to embark in a new season of your life, a bit unexpectedly, but you're continuing to use your voice on social media. Can we expect anything from you in the next few weeks and months with your voice online? So now that I have more free time, definitely going to be more on YouTube and making more long form content because uh, most of the content I do right now is very short form, Instagram, Twitter, but definitely got to deep dive into a lot of topics, especially when it comes to 
um, Asian politics and like the Asian American experience awesome. because um, Asian Americans, it, they, we are the fastest growing voter bloc in this country proportionally. And, and so to be able to win over Asian Americans, um, to show them the merits of conservatism and show them how they're being completely duped by the left. So stay tuned for that. and. That's what they can look forward to. Well, I'm so excited to see what all of that is going to look like in the next few weeks. And we're so grateful that you took the time to be here on the program with us today. Thank you for everything that you're doing, Kongman. And I know the best is yet to come for you. So thanks for joining us on the front lines. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we have more crazy stories of leftists infiltrating higher education in our state of campus. Don't go anywhere. This is on the front lines. Do you remember as a kid watching WALL-E where thousands of people on spaceships zoned out 24 hours a day staring wide-eyed at a screen? I do, and I specifically remember thinking that would never happen in real life. Well, here we are in 2021, at a time when screens are ruling the world. As every aspect of our culture becomes more connected to the digital space, so has the culture war, and it's never been more true for American higher education and today's college students. Today, we're scrolling through the craziest stories from the front lines of education online. Trust me when I say the propaganda online is as textbook commie as it gets. It's time for your state of campus. Conservative voices on social media have been considered controversial for some time now, but today there are off-screen consequences for those who dare to challenge the left's narrative online. This year, the president of the Student Government Association at the University of North Alabama faced calls for his resignation after he posted his religious views regarding the LGBT community on his personal social media. Jake Statham reposted a photo of a shirt that featured a rainbow and the words, born this way, you must be born again, on his Instagram story. Immediately, chaos ensued on campus, calling for Jake's resignation, including the creation of a change.org petition, which said, while people are entitled to their own personal beliefs, as the SGA president of a university with an active LGBTQIA community, Jake Statham needs to show he is capable of protecting the interests of all students. As long as our SGA president is openly homophobic, it would be impossible for UNA to truly be a safe space for the LGBTQIA plus community. So clearly he is not entitled to his own personal beliefs and not entitled to his personal freedom of religion, but is entitled to only post things on his personal social media that are accepted by all. I'm sorry, but posting a controversial shirt doesn't just automatically create a dangerous place for minority groups on campus. If you dislike someone's shirt, feel free to tell them, but don't cancel them over it. Look, whether you agree with Jake's position or not, the response to a single 15 second Instagram story on someone's personal social media account should not be an immediate calling for their cancellation. Makes me really wonder if we're just entitled to hate and censor anyone who dares to say something controversial. You know what's worse than being forced to resign from student government? Being expelled from your university for a racist social media post that you never even posted in the first place. Georgia's Wesleyan College recently made the insane decision to expel a student for allegedly, keyword here, sharing a social media post containing the N-word. The school's president, Vivia Fowler, said on the morning they learned of the post, they launched an investigation and expelled the student that afternoon, giving her the right to appeal. Of course, the student did appeal because it turns out the post wasn't even made by the student. Instead, it was someone else posing as a Wesleyan College student with a fake account on social media. Campus hate has gotten so bad that school leadership automatically assumes that conservative students are always responsible for hateful acts and posts. The nerve, the nerve. The school immediately backtracked and reinstated the young woman at the university, but they also used the situation, of course, as an opportunity opportunity to tout their diversity efforts. They said reinstating the student will not deter us from doing our part to denounce racism and hate. We are proud of our diverse student body. When it comes to diversity of thought, though, Wesleyan is about as diverse as a white girl reading Nicholas Sparks on the beach while sipping a pumpkin spice latte. Want to know what's just about as basic as that? Leftist professors in leftist universities. Gross. Up next is our professor watch list.
We all know how bad indoctrination has gotten on campus, but just as leftist professors have become emboldened to lie about conservatives on campus, they've now taken their propaganda online. Lars Mayshak, a professor of history at Fresno State University, is no exception. Lars has publicly called for the execution of both former President Donald Trump and all conservatives on his Twitter. Of course, this type of content is allowed to be posted, but President Trump is prohibited from posting anything. Makes sense in this upside down world. This college professor actually tweeted, has anyone started soliciting money and design drafts for a monument honoring the Trump assassin yet? But wait, there's more. He also tweeted, hashtag the resistance, hashtag ethnic cleansing. Justice equals the execution of two Republicans for each deported immigrant. Just imagine for a moment if a conservative professor had said this about a liberal. It wouldn't be a tweet, it'd be a croak. The outrage would break Twitter. Social justice snowflakes everywhere would flood every feed with regurgitated memes about systemic racism and white supremacy. Phew. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. And that's the hypocrisy we're up against. I'd say Professor Mayshak's tweet is shocking, but since the left has already normalized the murder of children, it's no wonder they get away with tweets calling for executions of conservatives. Lars Mayshak, you're on our list. And all you other educators out there, keep it up, and you just might make our professor watch list. Jumping back on campus, the insanity continues at the University of Washington, Tacoma, where a new initiative has been launched on campus to develop a tool that scans Twitter posts for hate speech or misogyny, because there's nothing that understands humans better than artificial intelligence. The two professors spearheading the creation of this tool say they're interested in using artificial intelligence techniques that try to grasp meaning or categorize natural language into some specific pre-assigned categories. This tweet is misogynistic, or that one is offensive toward immigrants. Uh, can someone say big brother? I guess censorship of posts that go against the narrative just isn't enough anymore. We actually have to prevent these posts from going up in the first place through using AI. Really sounds like a free society to me. Let's just keep creating more ways to silence speech. Maybe one day we won't need to talk at all because the computers will just decide that everything that comes out of our mouths is offensive. I am convinced that leftists have never seen or read science fiction, by the way, because if they did, they'd learn that when it comes to robots patrolling society, things never end well for humanity. Ever seen iRobot 2001, A Space Odyssey, and The Terminator, or how about Avengers Age Voltron? You know what else never ends well for humanity? Slavery. Who's the only group of people perpetuating the topic of slavery? The left. Ibram X. Kendi, step aside, because Juilliard now gives tutorials on how to be a racist. The Juilliard School, yeah, the Performing Arts University in New York, recently hosted an online slave experience during a diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop called Slavery Saturday in an attempt to advance what they call anti-racism. But you'll see no difference between this and blatant racism as we unpack this story. An auditory experience of enslavement for students, which included audio clips from a slave auction scene from a television series and a historic chant that repetitively yells the N-word, was played for students at the university. Is this supposed to be progressive? Also, what's next? Sacrilege Sunday? Woman-hating Wednesday? I can keep this up all day. On a more serious note though, naturally and expectedly, black students at the university were traumatized. Due to their complaints, Juilliard immediately backtracked and has been apologizing ever since. They've said, we deeply regret that the materials used in the auditory exercise were not screened in advance and that once the exercise was occurring, it was not stopped. You don't say. Reminder, we live in a world where educated adults are afraid that Dr. Seuss characters might look racist. But reimagining slavery, a literal crime against humanity, is totally fine at a school where people do ballet. Based on these stories, it may seem like the left is dominating the culture war online, but we're wrapping things up today with some great news from none other than the Supreme Court of the United States. This past summer, SCOTUS issued an 8 to 1 ruling in the Mahanoy Area School District, VBL, that the content shared by students off campus on social media is protected by the First Amendment. Campus Reform reports that BL, the plaintiff who chose to remain anonymous, sued her school district after her school kicked her off the cheerleading squad due to a profane rant about 
about the school that she posted on her Snapchat. After making the junior varsity team instead of varsity, BL used a four letter word in reference to the school during her rant, which Justice Breyer responded to saying, it might be tempting to dismiss BL's words as unworthy of the robust First Amendment protections discussed herein, but sometimes it is necessary to protect the superfluous in order to preserve the necessary. How many times a day does someone say they hate their school? Should I be banned from school for expressing my anger after I just went through sweat and tears and tryouts only not to make the team I worked so hard for? I get it if BL was like 10 and her parents were telling her not to swear, but this is a teenager just trying to blow off some steam. I'm sorry that the school is offended, but do you want all your students to be happy and grand every single day when they're not? They will all literally turn into psychos. Congrats for BL for winning the case and proving that you can use your First Amendment as you see fit. Way to stand up and fight against social media censorship. You have proven that schools cannot discriminate based on what you post online. To all you students out there, do not stay silent when your campus tries to make you silent. No matter what, you will always still have your First Amendment and no deranged leftist professor can take that away from you. Now that's a state of campus. As the digital world has begun to dominate the real world, what happens online and on social media has never been more impactful for the future of American culture. Colleges and high schools alike will do everything they can to indoctrinate students online, spread lies about conservatives on social media, and target freedom-fighting students for what they choose to post. But we are not backing down. No matter what, there is always hope. The preservation of a free society is always worth fighting for. And as long as we have conservative students empowered to stand up on campus and online, woke culture will be forced to fight back against reason, freedom, and American values. This is your voice, your stories, your fight. Together, we are on the front lines.